You guys have a great day. <laughs> now we're recording. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Enjoy yourself. Take it away, Amy. Thank you so much. Sorry for that little interruption there. Uh, really, really thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, now as we move into the program, I just want to let you know that Vicki will be happy to field your questions at the end. So please hold your questions until then, or if you want to type them in the chat so you don't forget them, um, that's great, but we'll just save them until the end to answer. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter for today, Vicki Stiles. Vicki has been the executive director of the Shoreline Historical Museum since 1992. She has a BA in archeology span and an MA in anthropology and museum administration from the University of Washington. She is a past president of Shoreline Breakfast Rotary and also as um, served as president of the Association of King County Historical Organizations. We're very glad to have Vicki um, with us today to share some of Lake Forest Park's history with us. And Vicki, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Amy. And thank you for um, inviting me to do this program. Happy birthday to Lake Forest Park 60th. Um, it's really uh, a, a very rich in history place. It's um, probably, I'm going to leave some of your favorite topics out because it's almost impossible to talk about absolutely everything, but I hope I'm gonna give you a good overview uh, of the history of Lake Forest Park. And um, I'm gonna start out telling you a little bit about the museum, of course, and then I'll end telling you a little bit more about the museum. <clears throat> and in between, um, I'm gonna give you about three or four hours of Lake Forest Park history. So <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, it won't be quite that long. And uh, I understand if you have to leave if I go over. <clears throat> So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. And um, again, thank you also Mayor Jeff Johnson for, for your beautiful introduction to the history of Lake Forest Park and all the great connections that um, we have in that beautiful city of yours. Oh. Okay, thank you again to Third Place Commons for sponsoring this program. And um, of course, I want you to know a little bit about the Shoreline Historical Museum. Our name actually comes from the school district uh, which um, started the museum uh, along with some community members back in 1975. It was started as a bicentennial project. And of course, it's a nonprofit, um, 501c3, operated by a board of trustees. And we're the number one resource for Northwest King County history. We're, uh, well, <clears throat> we're once again a full service <laughs> museum. Last year, we were closed uh, for. Pretty much uh, a little, well, a little over a year, we're open now again at 100% since June 28th. And we do have a research room archives, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on at the end of the program. I will be really excited to tell you about some developments here. And we do outreach programs and programs for kids and new exhibits. And in fact, um, let's see if I can show you. Right behind me is an exhibit on the um, environmental history of Lake Forest Park there. Sorry about that, I just wanted you to see. And you can actually come and see it now. That is um, the exhibit that we did for the 60th anniversary uh, of this fair city. And here's just a few uh, slides of programs that we have done. Here we are putting an exhibit in at third place um, on Lake Forest Park history. You can see that was the 50th anniversary. How time flies, my goodness, only 10 years ago. 
And here's some views of our exhibits um, at the museum. We also, uh, in good years, we do uh, a jury car show. And of course, we have a wonderful volunteer program for adults and high school students. And one of our pride and joys is our Trillium Heritage Award. And in Lake Forest Park, there are 14 uh, homes and one historic business that has been honored with a Trillium Heritage Award. And here, some of them you may recognize, the uh, Peterson House, the Wardeman Mansion, uh, Appleholt Snell, the Benson Bush House, and um, the Reed Hofer Estate, uh, when um, former Senator Fairley's house, uh, the Osborne house, Duncan Peters, the MacArthur store, which you know is whiz kids. So some really great places um, have received this award, all beautifully kept um, places that we're so happy to honor with this um, award. And the last one was the Tryon house, um, in 2019. So we hope to pick that Trillium Award um, back up in next year and uh, have it back on track and we'll find another beautiful nomination for Lake Forest Park. So again, welcome to the City of Lake Forest Park 60th Anniversary Historical Reflections. I'm going to start out by talking about the first people who lived in Lake Forest Park. And I want to give you a little bit of orientation. So I hope you can um, see my cursor. Here's Lake Forest Park in the upper right hand corner of this map. This map uh, depicts the 1859 survey done by the United States uh, government in preparation for the sale of this territory. Down here is Sand Point. Behind the map key would be Green Lake. Here we have Haller Lake, Bitter Lake, Echo Lake. Native American occupation here was the Duwamish tribe. And there were a number of family groups that lived along Lake Union and Lake Washington in the Thornton Creek watershed and the major watersheds of McAleer and Lion Creek. In Lake Forest Park, there was uh, an active village in what is now Lake Forest Park. And these people, the Tuobadabsh, uh, conducted lots of activities throughout this whole area. You'll see some dotted lines across the map that indicate major trails. And of course, we're not talking about trails like the Burke Gilman. We're talking about ways of getting from one important place to another important place. And of course, there was no restriction, so they could really go anywhere in this territory. They were creating controlled burns for agricultural activities to encourage the growth of um, native crops, such as uh, berries that grow naturally in this area. And by opening up meadowland, those cultivated areas also attracted small and large game. So these were hunting areas. This long controlled burn here is Greenwood Avenue and all around Echo Lake and just into um, the Lake Forest Park area. Um, unfortunately, uh, in 1855, the um, Elliott, Point Elliott Treaty was uh, instituted by the federal government and the Native Americans living throughout the county were um, really forced to go into um, reservation areas. So some people went to Tulalip, some people to Muckleshoot, and no territory, no reservation was created for the Duwamish, for whom the major city in Washington state is named uh, for a Duwamish tribal 
leader and elder chief Seattle. I won't try to pronounce his name in Lashute Seed. I'm not a Lashute Seed speaker, but that is the native tongue of the Duwamish people. And lots of um, very restrictive laws and um, treaties were created to move the Duwamish out of their native territory. So by the time the survey was done by the federal government in 1859, very few uh, Native Americans were living in this area actively. There were some who stayed behind, but the survey did not find an active village in Lake Forest Park at that time. Uh, one of the other things I want to point out is there was a very large cranberry bog here, and this was a meeting place between Lake Washington and Puget Sound, where not only the Duwamish people living in this area came, but uh, neighbors to the north and to the east also came to pick cranberries here. So it was a really vibrant area. Um, just full of resources and uh, all of the activities that the people did in this territory were left for um, the surveyors to find and then consequently people who moved into the area. And these are uh, some of the laws that happened that created the systemic marginalization of Native Americans in this area. Um, I think, I don't know what that is, but uh, one of the um, most interesting ones is that the Seattle Board of Trustees, which was really the Seattle City Council in 1865, banned Native Americans from living in the Seattle city limits. This basically made um, Duwamish people uh, strangers in their own land and without a country. And in 1876, the Supreme Court ruled that Native Americans were not citizens and could not vote. So this territory was opened up in 1862 after the filing of the um, 1859 survey, you can see the lines on the map represent, of course, the sections, townships, and ranges that the survey team worked out. Um, walking every single one of these lines, they laid out um, a map so that property could be sold. And this map is a Kroll map from 1862, and it was used until 1901 to record the names of the first certificate holders of these properties. When you hear somebody say, oh, grandma and grandpa homesteaded um, out here, chances are they probably didn't really homestead because that's a legal term. Most of these people acquired their property by paying the government $1.25 an acre. And the acreage along Lake Washington and Puget Sound was primarily purchased by Puget Mill, also known as Pope and Talbot. And then other concerns that purchased the property, almost all of these, Marshall Flynn, uh, Joseph Carpenter, w Williamson, these are all logging interests. And this territory was thoroughly logged, this whole area. Very few native stands of trees were left, except in Lake Forest Park, because the terrain was so difficult to operate in, Lake Forest Park was logged really very late in the game. So about 1901, is when the logging really was done in earnest in Lake Forest Park. And the reason they were able to do it is because the French and Fish Logging Company had a logging railroad. 
and they were able to lay track in a number of places throughout Lake Forest Park. In fact, they just moved their um, logging railroad after they logged an area, they would move the track just, and they kind of moved all the way around the lake, eventually taking down uh, every, uh, every tree that mattered. And you can see here, they're getting ready to dump the logs into Lake Washington. This um, pier is actually in Kenmore, so a little bit later than Lake Forest Park. And in the background, you can see one of the lake steamers, and I'll show you a little bit about that too. So um, you're going to see some pictures, maybe that will uh, just kind of make you think <laughs> about the environment. Um, that we now live in in Lake Forest Park. So this is an Anderson map uh, from 1910. And this is, was created just probably just after the sale. And here you see it says Lake Forest Park. Just after the sale of this land from logging interest to one Oli Hansen. So um, to give you a little bit of background, in 1909, Seattle had the first World's Fair in Washington State. It was the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, and it was supposed to commemorate the gold rush. It was a little bit late in that commemoration, but um, from uh, 1908 to 1911 or so, there was a lot of boosterism around the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, which occurred at what is now the University of Washington campus. And people were moving here because, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> because of the, not only because of the um, World's Fair, people came to it and they loved it here and they stayed, um, but there was a extreme, commercial uh, boosterism and every county uh, in Western Washington got into the game and promoted uh, people to move to their area. One of the things that happened in 1908, the Highlands, uh, Seattle Highlands was formed, the Seattle Golf Club, uh, Golf and Country Club was formed. And in 1909, when President Taft came out here to um, the AYPE. He also played golf at the country club. Well, uh, lots of people wanted to get in on the real estate deals. And Ole Hansen, who was a grocer in um, the South Seattle area, and a budding real estate developer saw his opportunity to really create a community and let's face it, make a whole lot of money. And he kind of grabbed onto the idea of the Highlands and advertised, his advertising uh, kind of poo-pooed that area and said, well, you don't need to live in a, a gated community this territory is open for everybody. So in December of 1909, he and his partner, Alexander Reed, purchased the area you can see here on this map. And they made plans to really, really promote it. So in 1910, they hired Aishel Curtis, who was a famous photographer in Seattle, very renowned. And of course, his photography is practically unparalleled by anyone else at that time here in, in the Northwest. And um, they had him take pictures. This isn't one of them, but one of the ways people could get out to Lake Forest Park was to come in on the Mosquito Fleet steamers. And that's how Ole Hansen actually discovered the property of Lake Forest Park 
he took the steamer around the lake and he saw that spot and said, um, well, I don't know what he really said, obviously. <laughs> we don't have a recording of him, but um, he felt that this was an area he could really promote. And it had already been cleared. There were no trees, uh, except for some uh, spindly growth and some trees that they couldn't log in uh, very ravine areas. And he supposedly got the name for Lake Forest Park from the steamer captain who said, gosh, this reminds me a lot of where I came from, Lake Forest, Illinois. So this hiring of Aishel Curtis in 1910, they started to promote Curtis's photos in the newspaper, the first advertisement for Lake Forest Park being in July of 1910, and they got ready to open up this territory for sale. And you probably recognize some of these iconic photos. Ole Hansen is in nearly every one of the photos. They took him and um, uh, his nephew and their kids and posed them in various photos. So here they are posing on the bridge. They also hired uh, Bertram Corlett to design Lake Forest Park in a fashion similar to the way that the highlands had been designed along the contours of the land instead of doing a grid like a city. And Ole really bragged about that fact that Lake Forest Park was even better than the Highlands. He didn't use that name in his advertisements, but um, he talked about how there were no straight lines. Everything was along the curves of, of the uh, land. And here you see them sitting in it. They're not traveling. They're sitting in this vehicle and posing for Aishel Curtis on well, what would become Bothell Way, the Garrett Erickson Road, it wasn't quite paved yet. And then here they are in a ravine uh, that really couldn't be logged very well, although you see they're on a skid bridge. So this is where the logging trestle came through near Brookside. And um, they made sure to pose nearly all of the pictures in front of trees and greenery so that it would look like it was really uh, a park made from a forest. And here's the Bertram Corlett survey crew and here they are posing again um, at what would eventually become the front of Lake Forest Park. So uh, all, probably most of these people can be identified as family members. And here Ole Hansen uh, was a great, not only a great land promoter, but he was also a great self promoter. He eventually became mayor of Seattle. And here he is riding with his favorite friend, Teddy Roosevelt, for whom one of his children was named. And um, Ole had at one time hoped to be president of the United States. This is the pier they built in for the front of Lake Forest Park. And if you look at this photo, you'll notice that there's really nary a tree standing. This is all growth that has happened since 19, the 1901 logging. And the um, logging pier is gone. Now they have this beautiful new pier. And right here, this is the intersection of what would be Ballinger Way and Bothe Way. And this is the five acre property that would become the Werdemans. And right there where my cursor is pointing is the little Lake Forest Park real estate office that was at the front of the park. And um, see, it's very hard to see, but there's a, there's a truck on Bothe Way. You can also see that the water comes right up to the railroad tracks. 
So there's railroad tracks running along here and um, the railroad, the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern had been uh, in constructed in 1887. So it was a pretty early railroad. It didn't exactly meet the commercial hopes of the people who built it and um, really became mostly an excursion railroad that went out to Gilman, which became Issaquah. And they would take people out for picnics. There was coal mining there um, and it's pretty likely that the train hauled coal occasionally, but the mine ran out. So it never did become uh, the commercial success that they had hoped. And here's another view of the pier. So 1912, they are now ready to start selling the property uh, in Lake Forest Park. And there's big advertising signs. This little store here was um, the Stetner's store. So they were related to Ole Hansen. Uh, they were uh, cousins of his wife, I believe. And they opened a little store that was outside of Lake Forest Park because in the covenants of the original Lake Forest Park plats, Ole Hansen said there could be no businesses. This probably was much to the detriment of the citizens living there because that meant you couldn't have a grocery store or any other services right within the Lake Forest Park proper. And the little store opened by the Stetners was actually outside of the Lake Forest Park plat on the other side of Bothell Way next to the water. And again, you can see how very high the water is here. And I just threw in the Hanson home on Broadway on Capitol Hill. Well, Ole Hanson actually never really lived in Lake Forest Park, but his nephew, Alexander Reed did, and he built the beautiful Reed estate um, just around the corner from the Worderman Mansion. And that is one of the Trillium Award winners that we honored. So here is what Ole had in Lake Forest Park, a little cottage and these um, platform tents are for his kids. He had, I think, 12 or 13 kids and the kids all grew up running around wherever they wanted in Lake Forest Park when they were out there, but they didn't actually live there. And they kept this country getaway but of course, once Ole was mayor of Seattle, they really didn't come out here very much. Um, but, but Alexander Reed practiced what he preached and Ole pretty much turned everything over to Alexander Reed for the sales and promotions of the Lake Forest Park property. And, um, of course, the completion of the Garrett Erickson Road happened in 1913, and wow, people started to get cars. Not a lot of people, but it really helped to promote the real estate development in Lake Forest Park by having a beautiful red brick road that went right through the front of the park. Here's the Worderman Mansion in 1915. Uh, Ole enticed several property owners by offering them the property for free if they would build something grand. And grand is what they built. The Werdeman House, the uh, Croxton Ryan House uh, across the street, and a, a few others that were pretty wonderful grand places that um, uh, Ole sacrificed this five acre piece of property, the sale of it, so that there would be something really beautiful um, at the front of the park. And thankfully it is still there. It's really a beautiful place. And here you can see uh, in 1915, a person standing on that beautiful pier we saw 
looking back and taking a picture, here's the Croxton Ryan house, um, right? You know, if it's the way this photo is taken, it seems like they're really far apart, but they're not. There's the road that goes up and the Reed house is just up here around the corner. Well, that little real estate building that we saw earlier had to be moved in order for the Wordermans to um, use this property. People were going to school in that little real estate office in 1913. That was the that was the schoolroom for the kids. It was moved um, to the Reed Estate here. You see in the bottom right hand corner, this is the Reed Estate. And here, if you can see my cursor, is the little school building slash real estate office. It's still there on the property. You can see it right from the road if you drive by this house. And in 1914, they built the new school, which um, stood for quite a long time. But a beautiful, beautiful school. Well, um, I just want to, I've said a number of times how high the water is right up to the railroad tracks. Here you see Lake Union, this is about 1900. And in the distance, you see Lake Washington, which is, um, you know, probably about 18 or 20 feet higher in elevation. And of course, way, way, way up there, we can't see it, is Lake Sammamish, which is connected to Lake Washington through the Sammamish River. We call it the Sammamish Slough now. So Lake Union and Lake Washington uh, were not connected. And this is the portage that Native Americans used, of course, and many other people. But when uh, Seattle began to be populated by um, the uh, non-Native immigrants that came to the area, the first thing they thought was, oh my gosh, we could connect those lakes. <laughs> it took a while, but there were lots of different plans about that. And then in 1916, it really happened. So the locks were built uh, between uh, Salmon Bay and Lake Union. And then the ship canal was created. Here they are breaching the portage. And well, what happens with water? It runs downhill and Lake Washington, the water in Lake Washington ran out as much as it could until there was equalization and um, the lake basically lost nine feet of water. Well, that translated into a lot of new lakeshore. And that probably wasn't necessarily a good thing for the environment, but it was an even worse uh, tragic calamity for the Duwamish people who were living along the Black River. So the Black River was the outlet of Lake Washington. Uh, Lake, Lake Sammamish and Lake and Sammamish River ran into Lake Washington. Lake Washington ran out of the Black River into the Duwamish River and thus to Puget Sound. And that was the salmon run from Puget Sound into Lake Washington came up the Duwamish River, up the Black River, into Lake Washington, up the Sammamish River to Lake Sammamish. When they breached the Ship Canal, the water in Lake Washington ran below its outlet and the Black River dried up. And so did the traditional way of life for the Duwamish people. That was really the last place they could gather together um, along the water and continue their traditional way of life, catching fish. Um, they, their population had been squished and moved and um, it was really a tragic thing. They were, the native salmon were eliminated from existence. So what we see today does not have anything to do with that original run. And not a single newspaper article uh, covered the tragedy that was visited on the Duwamish people. 
So here you see what happened after the lowering of the lake. Three years later, here's that beautiful pier we saw earlier. It's um, quite unusable. And uh, here we have the muddy lake bottom. You can see lots of mud here. It took a long time for this shore, the new shore to dry up, but people came and used the beach. Uh, I've had um, elders tell me, now I never knew any of these people, but elders who were the children of these people tell me that it smelled really bad <laughs> when they, um, the lake was lowered because of course this is all really uh, full of uh, detritus and um, plant material from the bottom of the lake. But how um, people knowing that this was going to happen, the Wardemans had taken advantage of it, and especially Puget Mill, they owned all of this new lakeshore and were able to sell it at quite a handsome profit as the lakeshore dried up. Meanwhile, more and more people are moving into the area. In 1923, a brand new school was built. The old one is behind this building. I'm sorry, we can't see it, but it's back there as the school library. People were getting cars. So there was a lot more mobility throughout the United States. And, and of course, here in Washington and in the Northwest, people were able to get out more. Um, they didn't necessarily have to be wealthy to own a car. And of course, we know about the Roaring Twenties. That's when the economy came roaring back from the brink of uh, economic disaster that had happened in the 1890s. And um, just things were going pretty good economically for people. Here we see again the, uh, the pier, another view of the pier, and some lakeshore property owners, the Johansons enjoying the muck about 1924. They couldn't even build anything on it yet. Um, but now the railroad tracks are pretty far away from the lake. And also, I want you to notice that uh, there's no trees. So the logging railroad is moving around, they've moved around, They've logged off everything. Kenmore, the moorlands is flattened. It looks like a moonscape. We're looking at Kenmore. We're looking toward Kenmore right now. So this is Kenmore back here. And you can see the, um, I've taken a 1936 aerial photo. Here we see the intersection of uh, Bothaway and Ballinger. Here's the Werdemann mansion by this time they've already um, sold off the back half of that five acres but the red line depicts where the railroad was and now you see the um, increase in lakeshore and of course this became Sheridan Beach owned by Puget Mill and here's a nice view of the brick road in about 1924, another Asia Curtis photo looking toward Kenmore. And the uh, original brochure that was done by Ole Hansen showed a, a fanciful depiction of a sign that hung on chains spelling out Lake Forest Park over the Ballinger entrance to the Ballinger Way entrance to Lake Forest Park. Well, people really, really wanted that sign. Of course, hanging individual letters by chains wasn't very practical to do, and that would have gotten wrecked pretty fast. So they finally did it, though, in about 1924. They put this Lake Forest Park arch up, and I heard uh, Mayor Johnson mention that he remembered it and uh, had driven under it. It stayed there for a very long time. And um, uh, finally, it wasn't big enough for some of the big trucks that come through. <laughs> but um, uh, it was a pretty neat sign. And in the back, you can, back you can see 
um, what had been the Stetner store was rebuilt and became the Ibo store. That store was there for a very long time. And I think probably some of you remember when it was also a veterinary clinic, had an unfortunate accident. Now we have the 1926 Kroll map of unincorporated Northwest King County. This is all unincorporated territory. Over here we have Lake Forest Park, which is all platted. There's hardly anything left that's not platted. This right here where my cursor is, was, is um, actually, it says Salisbury, but this is the, uh, oh, here we go, right here, sorry. The state property, um, the state used this property, traded it, traded it back. Uh, this was designated to the state in every few sections, you'll see state property that's designated for, they said schools, but really it could be used for anything by the state. And this is 15th Avenue right here and 145th to give you some perspective. So this all butts up against the Lake Forest Park additions two and three. And up here you see the Trayford tracks and the Davies tracks. And um, this is where the businesses ended up being in these sections outside of Lake Forest Park proper. And it's funny, I know that late, that Ole Hansen had second thoughts about what he did when he restricted businesses from being in Lake Forest Park. He realized, oh my gosh, you know, people do need services. And when he moved, he quit being mayor of Seattle in 1919 after the huge flu epidemic of 1918 and the uh, labor uprising of 1919, he went to California and he started a new place and he, he really got it right, that San Clemente, California, he invented that and he created um, business districts for San Clemente, which he wished he had done in Lake Forest Park. Well, that's okay. It's all good now. But um, it's very interesting to see how between 1910, the Anderson map, and 1926, this has all been platted now. There's hardly anything that's really um, not ready for sale. And uh, there's a few like Puget Mill owns, owned a few things on the west part near um, Puget Sound. but. Um, most of that's going to be developed in just a few years away from this 1926. Another um, really not good thing happened in 1926. The Supreme Court ruling of Corrigan versus Buckley. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that and some other things that were happening nationwide. Nationwide. There was no exceptions. Uh, but that were affecting our local demographics. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the demographic homogeneity and systemic se segregation that happened um, not only here, but all over the United States. But it certainly affected how our community looked then and how it looks today. So this is a, a timeline of some of the broad sweeping um, rulings by the United States that created a lot of segregation. And we can go all the way back to 1854 where Native Americans weren't allowed to testify in court. And um, even though in 1870, it said the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied, but yet that did not include Native Americans. There was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, 
the Dawes Act that opened up tribal lands as surplus so that non-native people could buy reservation land. Uh, and then, as I said, in 1926, Corgan versus Buckley, the Supreme Court said that property covenants refusing land sales based on ethnicity and race were okay. And there was a huge, huge, just landslide of covenants being added to plats. Almost everything platted after 1926 north of the Ship Canal had covenants that did not allow the sale of land to anyone other than Caucasian people. There's dozens and dozens. And plats that were done before this, what would happen is those covenants would be added as people sold their properties. And of course, there are other systemic uh, rulings that affected the whole country and, and affected us as well, because here we are. Um, of course, the Executive Order 9066 um, finally, um, you know, I know they're not all listed here, but in 1948, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court reversed the 1926 Corgan versus Buckley decision, but there was no recourse. So even though they reversed the decision, the restriction of land sales continued all the way up until 1968 when the Civil Rights Act and Fair Housing Act were actually put teeth to that decision and said, no, that's illegal and you can be punished for refusing to sell to um, people of color. So that really affected the demographics of the Northwest King County area. And here are just a few of the examples and you may find these in your own deeds um, and doing title searches, you may find these restrictions in your very own um, properties. It, it is a matter of history, unfortunately, and still affecting us today, but both Governor Christine Gregoire and Governor Jay Inslee have enacted um, a couple of bills that uh, help us mitigate these um, wrongful things and help, help us write these things. And if you want more information about this, um, you can go to the University of Washington's Seattle Civil Rights and Labor History Project website where you can um, do your own research and understand how this has really affected our communities. So the 1920s were a great time of development for the area. And as Lake Forest Park was developing all around it, lots more plats were happening. And I pointed out that state property earlier that was supposed to become a state park. So the land developers um, like, uh, Brett, well, not necessarily Sheridan Beach, but this is the Pope and Talbot uh, Sheridan Beach development in 1927. A whole bunch of others were happening at this time. Finally, this property was dried out enough to sell it. Here's Baffle Way right along here. And there's the Pope and Talbot real estate office. Um, the, um, this is the Civic Club built in 33 and a brand new pier. I got that a little out of order, but <clears throat> Lago Vista and the Davies Five Acre Tracks and all of those Jardine El Norte, Monte Vista, um, the, the Lake Forest Park third edition. These were all outside of the Lake Forest Park original plats, but because all the kids went to the Lake Forest Park grade school, people considered themselves as Lake Forest Park residents and if you ask somebody who lived in Monte Vista, for instance, where do you live? They say, oh, I live in Lake Forest Park. 
and um, uh, people in Lago Vista, their children all went to the Lake Forest Park School and um, participated in Lake Forest Park activities. So people really, really um, focused on Lake Forest Park residency. Here's Chardin El Norte. The, uh, El Norte, this whole area along 15th is where all the businesses developed. And so lots of people were shopping in these little mom and pop stores all along 15th and on Ballinger Way. So that's where the businesses began to really, really spring up. And here's a few others. This one on the right hand side in the lower um, corner, that is the North City Tavern that still exists on 15th. You, you can go to it <laughs> and see, it is a darling little building. Getting water was a big challenge. Here you've got um, all these people moving out here. How are they getting water? Well, lots of people had wells, but people who couldn't afford wells would go to natural springs like the one at Lago Vista. And that was on 15th here. We're at 15th and about 194th or so. Um, Ron Traer, who's a resident of Lago Vista had to haul buckets of water to his family's home. Uh, that's been capped off now, but uh, <clears throat> the Lake Forest Park Water Company, this was happening all over uh, Northwest King County. Water companies were forming and they began in 1926 uh, to help provide um, good water to Lake Forest Park residents. Uh, sewers were another issue and there was a lot of problems for Lake Washington was absolutely filthy and all of the residential areas around Lake Washington were contributing to the pollution of the lake. <clears throat> Everybody had um, septic tanks or uh, French drains and um, really caused a lot of problems with Lake Washington. That's a whole nother story. And I could probably talk about that for another hour. Meanwhile, that state park property that we were um, looking at earlier, well, it became the Navy hospital during World War II. Uh, the Navy constructed a hospital there that was never federal property. The state allowed the use of the property by the federal government. Uh, I don't know that it was a mandate by the federal government, but they had to have a hospital out here. Soldiers were brought to this hospital to Lake Forest Park by train, by that Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern train, and offloaded onto buses and then um, brought up to the Navy Hospital, which had somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,300 beds, and it was full. This eventually became uh, the new Furland Tuberculosis Hospital it, after the Navy left in 47. And now today it is Furcrest. Then finally sewers came along. This is the laying of the sewer lines on 145th. And of course, none too, none too soon. <laughs> sewers were really, really needed. And after World War II, of course, the area was absolutely booming. They couldn't put sewers in fast enough. They couldn't build schools fast enough. So many hundreds and really thousands of people were moving into the Northwest King County area, including Lake Forest Park and its surrounding communities. Well, of course, I've alluded to the lack of businesses in Lake Forest Park, and a lot of people really wanted to keep Lake Forest Park proper, strictly residential. There was a lot of back and forthing about this. They did not want the development of a shopping mall to happen in the middle of their community. And um, that was really one of the larger reasons why the city of Lake Forest Park was formed in 1961, 
but the county wouldn't let them incorporate the shopping center property. So there was a donate, a donut of unincorporated area in the middle of Lake Forest Park, which looked pretty funny on the map. Um, and, but of course, uh, cooler heads prevailed and eventually Lake Forest Park was able to incorporate not only that donut hole, but also the lakefront property had not been allowed to be part of uh, the original Lake Forest Park city territory and that was also incorporated in 1964. So here we see um, the opening of Pay and Save and Mayor Fran Holman welcoming the shopping center. You know, what are you going to do? And of course, we know today it is a beloved part of Lake Forest Park and we really couldn't live without it. It's so wonderful to have this um, great place for all of us to shop. Here we see the first city council uh, and um, I, I feel lucky to have known a few of these folks. And uh, of course today we have Mayor Johnson and then uh, today's city council um, who carry on the duties and challenges of maintaining the wonderful city that Lake Forest Park is. And of course, uh, one of the finest city police departments in, in the area for a small city, Lake Forest Park has a great um, uh, city police department. And here we see the first Lake Forest Park police chief, Ken Foster, practicing quick draw at the FBI firing range at Fort Lewis. And um, there's a really fun story. Well, it's fun now. It was certainly nerve wracking when it happened, but um, uh, there was a jewelry store run by the Kmets in the shopping mall and they were robbed and um, Chief Foster grabbed the store owner, threw him into the police car and they went on a chase <laughs> to uh, chase down the robbers. There were shots fired. A very interesting story. I don't think that would probably happen today. So Washington State Growth Management Act of 1990 created a lot of challenges for um, every city across the state. And Lake Forest Park went from uh, uh, being a 4,000, about a 4,000 person city to 13,000 by the year 2000, tripling its size and population. And, and I'm sure, sure presenting some more challenges for um, the city government and administration. And of course, uh, the city had to have a city hall. And here we are with the dedication of the beautiful building that um, Lake Forest Park has today. And wow, what a long, Lake Forest Park has come a long way. And I know there is a lot more journeying to do but what a great city and um, really 60 years, in 60 years, a lot has happened um, with Lake Forest Park. Here, this beautiful messenger, uh, Ole Hansen said, nature's master hand will not be dwarfed and streams and springs will be protected. And of course, Lake Forest Park is doing a great job of that in their own city citizens really care about the environment of Lake Forest Park. Now, just a little bit of what's new for the museum. Here's our new collections and research facility. It's finished. We are now installing all of the archives, including the vast Lake Forest Park files we have and hundreds of photos. And um, I hope some of you will come and do research there. So, Thank you, Third Place Commons, again, and thank you, everybody, for being here. That's my story.
Thank you, Vicki. That was so interesting. So I think now if we want to, we can take some questions. I know there are a couple of questions in the chat, but we can see if anyone wants to chime in as well. Why don't I start with the ones that are in the chat and then let folks formulate their questions if they have others. So scrolling back. Well, first of all, I want to mention that Karen Connell um, did say that she has, her family moved here in 1959. So they were here. I asked at the beginning if there was anyone here. So, um, wow. so there's someone in addition to um, she Mary Johnson. So, that. Yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, one of the questions early on was, do we know from Tom Bird was where do we know where the active village of Native Americans was in LFP? It was approximately well. It was where the shopping center is. Okay. All right. Great. Um, let's see. Then um, Regina Fletcher asked, have any Native American signs or artifacts been found? And would finding any artifacts change how the land is used moving forward? Uh, I do not personally know of any. So I, I can't, um, I don't know if people have found those privately in their yards, but uh, so much has happened to the land as far as building and that sort of thing. It would probably be unusual to find something, but if somebody does, we'll certainly address that. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked if anyone famous has, been, has come out of Lake Forest Park. Why, yes, as a matter of fact, there are many famous people in Lake Forest Park. And um, I, I'm, I can think of a couple of people that actually talk about in my women's history um, uh, talk. And one is Marilee Rush, who um, is a still around and a famous um, singer from here. And, um, oh my goodness. So I'm gonna forget names, I'm so sorry, but uh, uh, a recent resident uh, science fiction writer, uh, woman, I'm sorry, I can't, sorry, can't oh, say her name. Octavia. Octavia, Octavia Butler, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I just, you know, I. <laughs> so yeah. um, that's a couple I can think of, but I'm sure there are many others. There are probably others, yeah. Many so of Sally out here are famous. <laughs> yeah. Um Sally Yamasaki mentioned, I think you did touch on this maybe after she'd written it, but that the to mention just that the Shoreline Historical Museum also includes Lake Forest Park, which you did mention that you have lots of goodies there. And then um also, can you talk about the history of recently acquired Lake Forest Park property, Duck Haven? Uh, oh, I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I'm afraid I only know enough to be dangerous about that. So that might be a whole nother talk. And I suspect that maybe Sally could probably tell us a lot more about that than I can, but um, uh, I, I know about it, but I can't recite the history of it right off the top of my head. So sorry about that. Thank you for asking though. I think it's something we definitely want to um, research more and have that information here available at the museum. Yeah. Someone gave a shout out to Tony Angel, the artist and author yes. as another very that's another. I'm sure yeah. there were there are more, more as well, but that's a great, yeah, that's a great call out. So if our folks have questions, you can um, unmute and ask your questions now if you'd like to, or if you wanna use the reaction button, you can click the little raise your hand button and we can call on you if you'd rather do it that way. We have a lot of people here, so we can't see everybody on screen at the same time. So if you uh, wanna just chime in or raise your hand so you pop to the top. We have other questions? You're welcome. I'll just soak it in. 
everyone was just so overwhelmed with the information. It's hard to think of questions when it's just coming at you so fast. Right. It was a lot of great <laughs> stuff. It was a lot of great stuff. Yeah. And there's more really. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I think, let me just, uh, well, we'll leave it. We'll leave it in gallery. So thank you so much, Vicki. This is, I, I think the, um, this has been a really, really interesting look back. I mean, there's so much that I didn't know, um, you know, as a relative new to comer to the community, getting to work here and get to know the community as it is now. It's really um, interesting to have that look back and to see how things were and to see how they've evolved over time. It's really um, brings it to life in a new way. So thank you so much for that. Thank you to everyone for taking some time out on this beautiful, sunny Saturday afternoon to spend some time with us and to learn about Lake Forest Park. We really appreciate it. And Vicki, it's wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Have a terrific thank afternoon. Thank you very much. And please, everybody, feel free to contact us. And we're happy to share this information with you or, you know, uh, come to look at the maps if you're curious about those or just about anything. And yeah, thank you, thank Amy. You. Thank yeah. you so much. And we'll put our slide back up for anybody who wants to follow us just so you have that information. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.